Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Carol Adams, Professor of Accounting at Durham University Business School in the UK and founding editor and editor-in-chief of the Sustainability Accounting Management and Policy Journal, or SAMJ for short, which is now in its 13th year. Welcome to our second webinar, Exchanging Ideas Between Academics, Policy Influences and Practice Leaders. We have around 700 registrants represent, representing um, these, these three groups. The webinar is organized in collaboration with the Ethical Finance, Accountability and Governance Research Center at Durham University Business School, the Social and Environmental Sustainability and Organizations Research Group at Swinburne University in Australia, and the Adam Smith Observatory of Corporate Reporting Practices at the University of Glasgow's Adam Smith Business School. I want to thank the events team at Glasgow University for helping with the organization. Now, there's been a substantial global academic accounting community working in the field of sustainability reporting, particularly over the last three decades, as the dangers of sustainable development megatrends to people and planet and the role of business in contributing to them have become increasingly apparent. The globalization of business has had and continues to have consequences for future generations to bear. Research evidence is clear that accounting and reporting practices have unintended consequences. How, how do we increase accountability and responsibility for impact on sustainability and finance flows to sustainable development? Well, Sanjay aims to provide an evidence basis to support the development of practice and policy issues that aim to contribute to sustainable development. So I'm delighted that Associate Professor Subhash Abhayawansa, Dr. Mark Alexanian, and Professor Yanis Salavutas agreed to edit a special issue of the journal on the standard setting in sustainability reporting. And I'm particularly grateful to Subhash for leading that process. We have an excellent panel for you today to discuss the issues raised in the three papers that will be included in the special issue. Um, or, or three of those papers. So thank you to all our speakers for joining us. First off, we will hear from authors of two thought-provoking papers with responses from senior policy influences, and then we'll move to a plenary discussion informed by academic input to the debate on sustainability reporting policy. If you are inspired or even troubled by what you hear um, and the developments more broadly, please consider submitting an evidence-based piece to the journal. And look out for our upcoming special issue on the work and influence of the Global Reporting Initiative, guest edited by Professor Carol Tilt and Dr. Mercedes Luca-Vilche and colleagues. Now the session is being recorded and now it's time for me to hand over to Professor Yanis Salavutas from the University of Glasgow's Adam Smith Business School. Yanis. Hello, everyone. Um, good morning and good afternoon and good evening. Um, it is a pleasure to introduce um, the first uh, speaker and the discussant of that paper, uh, Begonia Ziner, and has co authored this paper with Mercedes Luc Vilches. And um, they are discussing a commentary on the new institutional actors in sustainability reporting standard setting, and they provide a European uh, perspective. Um, Begonia is a full professor of accounting and finance at the University of Valencia in Spain. And at the same time, she's chair of the stakeholder reporting committee of the European Accounting Association. Um, I will pass on the floor to Begonia uh, in the interest of time to, to present the paper. We thank you very much for your contribution. Um, and uh, I will give you a heads up uh, two minutes before the end of your presentation for passing on to the discussion. Okay, over to you, Begonia. Well, thank you. Good morning and also good afternoon and good evening to all of you. It's a great pleasure to be here today to talk about our paper on sustainability reporting. And both Mercedes and I thank you very much the editors for having given us the opportunity to be discussed in this workshop. 
sustainability reporting field has been growing gradually during these last decades, but it has been in the last two years when it has an impressive development. From being prepared by companies on a voluntary basis following different proposals, mainly those of the GR, GRI, either for good reasons or to achieve some certain, certain purposes, in the very near future, it will become mandatory and assured in many countries. Two new institutions are leading the change. The European Commission, together with the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, whose area of influence is the European Union and the IFRS Foundation, which does not have such a specific area. Moreover, the European Commission has the ability to impose the standards on companies, while the foundation does not have such a possibility. Although we cannot forget that the IFRSs are now applied in about 150 countries. The purpose of this paper is to discuss the progress and future prospects of the two new institutions in the field and provide some suggestions for future research. In this paper, we discuss in detail two documents issued by them, the proposal for corporate sustainability reporting directive issued by the European Commission in April 2021, and the consultation paper on sustainability reporting issued by the foundation in September 2020. Although they are the two pillars of our analysis, we also consider other documents that were made public earlier, in particular, the report of the EFRAC task force that was published before the uh, proposal of directive, and also some other later papers as well as, as later documents, as well as some academic papers that have been very uh, useful to enlighten our paper, our arguments. But I have to admit that given the speed on the matter, some of some relevant documents have been published after having accepted the paper, so they are not mentioned in it. In particular, the two exposure drafts by the International Sustainability uh, Standards Board and the 13 by EFRA. In that sense, our paper might be seen as historical. Our paper discusses how the two institutions deal with four main aspects, target audience, scope, materiality, and reporting boundary. Before briefly referring to them, I wish to highlight that uh, the proactive versus reactive attitude of the two institutions. The European Commission decision to issue sustainability reporting standards is aligned with the European Green Deal objectives and aims to encourage a shift in the firm's behavior towards achieving sustainability development. However, the entry into the field of the foundation was in response to calls for them to do so. And they don't aim to change behavior, but help investors to value companies. As it has been evidenced by IFRSs, the adoption of new standards might have unintended consequences. In fact, investors and companies might change their decisions due to the new sustainability reporting standards. And in that sense, the ISSV could also be seen as an enabler of change. Not surprisingly, the two institutions have chosen different rules or partners. Thus, the European Commission together with EFRA uh, chose GRI as the first co-constructor of the European standards which is an organization supported by a broad representation of the civil society, the juniors, NGOs, while the IFRS Foundation has the support of institutions that focus on enterprise value. The Value Reporting Foundation, which is the merger of the IARC and SASB, among others. <clears throat> uh, regarding our comparative analysis, of the four aspects, the European Commission, in line with the sustainability reporting literature uh, and, in the, and with the provision set out in the Article 3 of the Maastricht Treaty, uh, considers a wide range of stakeholders. So investors, non-governmental associations, social partners, and other stakeholders, they are the primary users without giving investors any preferential treatment while the IFRS Foundation is oriented to investors, which is also consistent with the mission regarding the issuance of IFRSs. As for the scope, the European Commission and EFRA together is initially a proposal is more ambitious than the one of the IFRS Foundation, since it covers uh, environment, social government, government, governance, as in the non-financial reporting directive issued in 2004 but also it also refers to non-recognized intangibles as recommended by the EFRAC task force. While the foundation 
decision to start with a climate related report with reporting seems to be rather more limited. However, based on recent later developments and reports by relevant working groups, this could, could be also only a question of time. So they could expand their scope as well. Regarding the materiality approach, the European Commission EFRA proposal requires considering not only the outside in perspective, which refer to the financial impacts on the company uh, as the IFRS Foundation does, but also consider an inside out approach. This is the report of the company, uh, the, of the impacts of the actions of the company on society and environment. However, as soon as these impacts on the outside affect the entity value, the inside out approach might become outside in approach and then fi become financially material. So I would say that in some way, the, for some risks and opportunities, the similarities or differences between both approaches will depend on the horizon. The longer the horizon, the more likely is that a rebound or boomerang effect happens and the inside out uh, impacts affect the company. Finally, about the reporting boundary, according to the European prior slide, please, thank you. Uh, the reporting boundary, according to the approach of the EFRA and European Commission, the whole value chain should be considered, both upstream and downstream. But uh, for the IFRS Foundation, only uh, the, well, the, the IFRS Foundation maintains the same reporting boundary as for financial reporting. However, since the IFRS Foundation follows the TCFD with regard to climate suits, one would think that the ISSB will have not only an inside out, uh, an outside in approach to materiality, but also an inside out and a broader reporting boundary, as it happens with the scope three of the GHI HG emissions. Well, to conclude my presentation, I will refer to our research suggestions, which in some way imply doing more policy relevant research that might help the standard setters decisions. Uh, it will be interesting to see st studies that explore how the differences identified between uh, when comparing the two approaches evolve and how potential partners are positioned in the new landscape. We also think that the new, uh, it would be interesting to look at the new role played by actors from the professional environment, consultant, consultants, assurers, in disseminating the ideas and practices derived from the proposals of the European Commission EFRA and the IFRS Foundation. And uh, finally, given the, the, given the timing of the standard setting process and knowing that the first EU reports will be referred to year 2024 and available in 2025, we don't know about the about the, the standards issued by the ISSB when they will be applied. Even purely conceptually works as well as studies based on the limited empirical work would be would be welcome additions to the literature. Well, thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to the comments of the discussion and others. Thanks. Begonia, thank you very much uh, for the very interesting presentation and for keeping on, on time. Um, I will pass on to Samaila Subramani uh, now. Uh, Samila, um, sorry, Samila has been the Chief Executive Sustainability Officer of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange uh, since 2007. And she is responsible for advising the executive committee and board of the uh, JSC uh, on sustainability and the integration into strategy. Uh, it is an honor and a pleasure to have you uh, in the panel uh, in the uh, session today, Samila. Um, please, I hand over to you for discussing um, uh, Begonia's uh, Mercedes paper. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Ayanis, and thank you also, Begona, for the, the paper, Begona Mercedes. I think there's been so much to be learned from what the papers have discussed. And, uh, you know, the particular focus I wanted to bring in today was how this applies in, in a use case in the market. So the JSE has for a long time been involved in looking at trying to to integrate the long-term perspective into the markets, one of the foremost exchanges in the world in looking at sustainability and trying to incorporate that in our market. Now, while there does not exist any mandatory sustainability reporting in the South African market at this point, there are a number of features in the market which has actually worked together to get this market to a level where it's considered to be one of the most advanced 
uh, reporters in sustainability disclosures globally. Now that really talks going back to the heart of governance and looking at the issues and the drivers of change in this market. So I'm starting at that point because what I wanna do is to bring that together to what we're trying to do in how we're trying to create a better understanding in our market to our issuers and to really try to bring the focus to the issue of substance. And what does that really mean in trying to encourage a behavior shift ultimately towards achieving the aims of sustainable development? So if we look back at those, I mean, from the, from the corporation, of, I think it was King 2. So those of you familiar with governance codes uh, will know about the King codes of corporate governance, which have been a feature of the governance landscape in South Africa going back a number of years. Now, from the incorporation of King 2, King was very explicit in talking about the need to consider people, planet, and profit, and the need to consider that from a materiality perspective, but also that it is the responsibility of the highest governing body being the board and the executive of a company to be able to consider this and to factor that in and to really apply integrated thinking on understanding these challenges in sustainability and factoring that into how a business conducts its business and of course considers the value that it creates destroys or preserves, if you look at that. And the fact that King also recommended practice is integrated reporting. If you look at the integrated reporting framework, those notions are very much integral in these issues. So that has been the foundation in a country like South Africa that I think has led to better practices ultimately, but where we're sitting now at a junction where we're sitting with some of these features that are considered to be more advanced in a reporting landscape versus saying, well, how does that then fit in with this rapidly evolving landscape? So the paper talks about these developments that have happened in the last two years in particular, where we've seen a huge amount of consolidation seemingly between the different largely voluntary private kind of sustainability standards and frameworks institutions coming together. The feature of the IWSB, of course, is a major one in that space because of the influence and because of the fact that it now sits within a broader body of the IFRS Foundation and the fact that that has been influential in financial reporting. And of course, those standards have been adopted in multiple jurisdictions globally. So where did that leave the JSE and why should we even be wading in and looking at any kind of um, support or any kind of guidance to our market at this point when all of these things are still in a state of flux? The first thing is when we had to ask ourselves is why? And the answer to why has been that we have seen that our issuers in our markets, our reporting companies have been faced with a lot of confusion and said, and have approached the JSE and said, please, can you help us? Now, the biggest cries for help actually came from the smaller tier companies. So your larger entities tend to have big teams who are really spending a lot of time navigating a reporting landscape and are able to work through this a lot more easily. But very quickly, your top tier companies tend to down, taper down into a tail end, which becomes companies who are struggling with these issues, who often don't have huge amounts of money to spend on consultants and the like to be able to assist them with navigating these things and really needed something that they could use. So we applied our minds to this, we tested the waters, we asked what was relevant for our issuers, and there was overwhelming support, both from issuers and investors to say, please go ahead and do something in that landscape. And so navigating between what was existing, and of course, where a lot of that is now really dynamic as well, has been not the easiest space, but our draft guidance, which was issued in December, received a lot of positive response. And what we really tried to do was to be able to say, how do we create clarity? to the extent that we can in this evolving landscape for our issuers to understand where these things fit together. The challenges that they've been facing was that we're seeing a number of investors asking questions of listed companies, and they're not quite sure how to navigate that. What lens should they be using? How should that be approached? Secondly, we're a jurisdiction that receives a lot of foreign direct investment from other markets. So for example, the happenings in the EU, which have been covered in the, new, in the paper, uh, are very relevant to a market of black hours where some of the numbers being quoted are up to 70% of a foreign direct investment is in fact coming from there. So when you look at the impact on issuers in that market and the kind of information that is going to be required of them, it becomes very obvious that they need to actually understand how this landscape is evolving and who the influential players are going to be and what that means to us. So this is for an example of a diagram that we tried to put together. This is probably the one that we're hoping is the most helpful to issuers in our market in the draft guidance will be amended obviously to now incorporate the more recent developments that we've seen in the exposure draft, for example, from the IWSB. And it sketches for them 
who the target audience are, scope, boundary, and things like that, very similar to what has been covered by Begona in the paper, which we have found to be critical components uh, that people need to understand when they're tailoring their reporting. So how can, how can issues look at this? What should they be thinking about? Do they understand in terms of the different frameworks and standards what the target audiences are, what is the position on materiality, boundary and scope and the like. And that's what we've attempted to sketch out. We have, however, at the outset, asked, uh, asked the question of the why. And the why is, what is it that we wanna do? And if it is really about wanting to see that behavior shift towards understanding the imperatives of sustainable development, things like your planetary boundaries, the societal issues that we need to solve for, then the how you approach it, who you're reporting for, and what you're considering in materiality is very important. So in addition, what the guidance has done is taken those aspects into consideration and given narrative disclosure guidance that we're hoping is going to be useful for our issues in that regard. And and secondly, what we've also done is taken a step further and talked about impact materiality. And so we've developed a set of metrics that are not uh, completely our new thing. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, but have looked at the best practice that we've seen in the likes of GRI, um, even SASB, and as well as looking at, for example, the World Economic Forum disclosure guidance that had come out, putting that together and saying, at a bare minimum, if you really want to consider what is impact on particular issues on ES and G, here's some basic metrics that you can look at. And so that we've put out to public comment and the process of receiving that back and we'll issue our final guidance in June. So when I looked at the paper that was written by Begon and Mercedes, the usefulness of understanding where these frameworks came together was absolutely critical. Understanding where their ideological divergences might be is also critical, but I think more important to see the opportunity for the bringing together of these different perspectives and recognizing that the sustainable development challenges are very time bound, are very critical. And while the reporting landscape is trying to find this convergence, the fact is that we need to act now to impact and to create those outcomes that we want in sustainable development. And so looking at a double materiality perspective is absolutely critical from now. And in fact, should have been looked at for many years before this already. And considering how these things fit together and the need to understand stakeholder perspectives are all really important elements. So that's the way in which we've tried to put this together as JSE in a way that is hopefully useful to our market and our issues that brings a little bit of clarity about how the landscape is growing, but also admits that there's huge opportunity to influence that landscape going forward and also hopefully makes it clear that the practices today are gonna to determine whether we really have a society worth living in going forward. And ultimately that should be what we hold true as companies, as practitioners, and as professionals in this space. Thank you very much. I'll leave it there, Ernest. Many thanks, uh, Samira. Thank you for that. Um, we have a couple of minutes, uh, a few minutes until the next uh, session. And now that uh, you and uh, Begonia are here, just uh, I want to, to bring in one question, perhaps hear your reflections, and then we will move on to the next presentation. Um, Begonia talked about this uh, parallel uh, reporting, uh, you know, regime, if you wish, that on the one hand we have the EU um, directive and the EU developments in terms of reporting, and on the other hand we have the ISSP standards uh, being out. Um, I would like to hear a little bit Begonia's view on how she sees companies, you know, um, you know, um, uh, how companies, European firms, you think will deal with this situation? That are, do you think that they will find it very challenging to follow the EU uh, directives and, and regulations, but at the same time trying to be comparable with other firms, non-EU firms, which may try to adhere to the ISSP standards? And then on that, Perhaps Samila can share her views. You, you talked, Samila, about the challenges that um, firms in uh, South Africa has, have faced in terms of size. You talked about resources and the scale of things and smaller, large firms. So again, in, in, within the European Union, we have very small firms being listed and some very large firms. And do you think that they will face these challenges of these parallel reporting systems, if you wish? Um, you know differently so just some some uh, views on that and then we will move on to the next ne next session okay thanks well thanks janice for your very important 
point or question or doubt. I also have shared the same uh, doubts about how European companies may, uh, may cover the needs of the European directive when it appears and not only the directive, but also the future standards that will be uh, introduced by, by, the, by the commission in, in, in less than a year's time, probably. And at the same time, satisfy the needs of, uh, of the, probably of the stock exchanges if IOSCO uh, uh, in some way endorses and, and follows the ISSB route. Uh, well, I hope that um, Nowadays, at the moment, there are conversations between the two uh, boards, uh, ISSB, but I may have at the same time, in order to have a, well, some, I would say, common, common views, common baseline is the word that now is used for that, in the way that this financial, uh, uh, the ins I prefer to call about the outside in, inside out. So the outside in impacts on the company, uh, well, are, capture uh, the standards that refer to both uh, to these aspects are similar regarding climate, which is the thing that now is considered by the ISSB, are close or similar and avoid the uh, problems with that. But on top of that, we know that the European directive requires much more things, not only the other approach, which is the double materiality thing, but also taking into account, well, the other uh, aspects such as, well, governance, social, intangibles and these things should be on top of that so in that sense well european companies and not only uh, the listed companies large companies also listed companies but also large companies so about fifty thousand companies will be uh, forced to apply th these standards that affect the value chain and that will imply that some other smaller companies will also have to produce information to be used by the larger ones so Replying shortly to your question, I hope that there will be a common back, a common baseline that avoids difficulties. And then on top of that, the EU will, the European Commission will impose other things to European companies because it has some other uh, views in mind, other purposes. Sustainability development is the idea. Thank you. Thank you, Begonia. Um, Samila? Um, Yanis, yeah, I completely agree with Begonia. I think that uh, finding the, the common ground is going to be absolutely critical. Um, and you know, in that, I think I can never overstate enough the importance of bearing in mind what, why we're doing any of this. And that what we're really hoping to do is to be able to encourage that behavior change towards more sustainable development practices and outcomes ultimately. So the impact of what we do is going to be very important. Um, so the common baseline that we're hoping to achieve, I think is, is fantastic as a starting point, but it's also very important that we very quickly understand the different impacts and that at jurisdictional level, that kind of guidance, I think, is going to be exceptionally useful. So the additional requirements in the EU and giving guidance to just constantly remind, um, you know, issuers that there is a broader materiality that we need to think about, I think is going to be absolutely critical if we really want to achieve the objectives of sustainable development. So working together to, I think, um, understand that objective, firstly, is going to be important. And secondly, to seek to unite rather than to have polarizing jurisdictional differences uh, would be my, my short take on that, of course, fully supporting what Begonia said as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Samila, for these insights. Okay, I will stop here. I will thank you again both for your presentations. I note in the chat that many participants, um, um, you know, have started raising interesting questions. Uh, just to remind everyone that after the second session, the two presentations that follow, um, we will have uh, time in the end for Q&A and we will have all four speakers um, involved so we can share views and hear their, their opinions, okay? So we'll deal with as many questions as possible during the Q&A later on. So I'm handing over to my colleague, Mark Alexanian, who will be chairing uh, the second session now. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our second presentation, presentation of the second uh, paper. I'm delighted to welcome and uh, introduce uh, Mario Abella, who is a senior professor of accounting in uh, of practice in accounting at ESX School of Management in France. Uh, Mario's research interest focuses on uh, the accounting for sustainability 
and he previously led uh, accounting um, related initiatives at the World Business as uh, Business Council uh, for Sustainable Development. Uh, the the paper uh, Mar uh, um, Mario is presenting today it's um, it's a critical analysis uh, piece. Uh, it's uh, uh, entitled "A New Direction: uh, The Mainstreaming of Sustainability uh, Reporting." And then we'll have a discussion uh, that I'll say a few more uh, words about uh, later on. And uh, Mario, the floor is yours, uh, please. Uh, thanks, Mark. Hopefully um, everyone can uh, hear me okay. Um, and see the slides. Um, so my, my approach and my paper is quite different um, to the one that Begonia Mercedes put together. Um, really trying to understand, you know, what's going on here. And I think if we look at what's changed, there are, are three things that are, are noteworthy. Um, the first one is that uh, sustainability reporting for decades has been a, a voluntary activity and it's been seen as non-financial information to the extent that there has been discordance between um, often the narrative or the story companies tell in their sustainability reports um, versus uh, the story that's found uh, in their financial filing. So we've moved from that world to a world where now sustainability reporting, um, at least um, as fashioned by the ISSB, but also under the proposed CSRD, uh, is an integral part of financial information. In fact, under the ISSB standards uh, that are out for comment at the moment, uh, sustainability information is defined as financial information. So financial information, for those of you um, who are technically minded, uh, has a very specific meaning. It means that it's actually defined as information within the boundaries of the financial statements. So that has quite a major shift um, in this information that has typically stood apart to suddenly cohabit um, the same spaces of financial statements. Um, the other shift that we've seen is the purpose of sustainability reporting, which again for decades has been uh, about stakeholders and the mainstay of sustainability reporting has very much been the GRI standards and around 80% depends which jurisdictions you look at, but around 80% of sustainability reports are prepared in accordance with GRI uh, standards. So uh, that has really been the bedrock. And we've now seen this narrowing in terms of this significant uh, focus on uh, shareholders and the needs of capital markets. And then the third uh, point I wanted to raise, and that really, um, was the genesis of this paper. Um, it sparked a curiosity because um, as someone who's been in this space for a, a long time in the both financial reporting and sustainability reporting worlds, um, I was kind of puzzled, how did this happen? So if we just rewind a few years ago in the, um, the throes of the uh, corporate reporting dialogue where uh, you know, there were huge challenges to get any sort of convergence. Um, and, you know, the world was very much divided into, you know, financial and non-financial um, and standard setters kind of lining up on either side of that divide to suddenly sustainability's mainstream. Um, and it's, it's almost now unquestioned. It's like, well, this always made sense. And so that, that's really what sparked the curiosity. How, how did we go from a world where um, 
these things were considered uh, nay impossible to, of course, um, and now we have two major um, institutional arrangements or setups um, focused on mainstreaming sustainability reporting. So back to some basics. And for those who like philosophy, um, <laughs> you can keep listening. Those who don't, uh, maybe now's the time to go make a cup of tea. So when really looking for a way to think about this, um, I went back to basics in terms of what do we know about accounting change and how accounting change takes place. And of course, um, Foucault, the French philosopher, gives us some useful insights here because he says, you know, the changes that we see occurring in our world are usually, usually don't come around um, through major revolutions. It's these subtle micro shifts in the discourse to a point where suddenly um, these views of the world um, are seen as obvious and timeless truths and hasn't it always been this way? And Foucault says, well, hold on, history doesn't have a single author and there's a diversity of experience here um, and there's lots of contests so, uh, and battles that happen at the margin of this change. And we saw those um, uh, in terms of um, those who are part of the CSRD, the tensions, uh, sorry, part of the CRD, the tensions around uh, the NFRD, the fact that um, we had fairly low compliance. Uh, the second philosopher, Hacking, talks about these classifications, well, these labels of um, uh, financial, non-financial, are very significant because they are the basis of our calculations. So we count what is financial, we don't count uh, what is non-financial. And that leads me finally to um, Barad. Uh, Karen Barad is a US philosopher. Um, and she says that basically all matter is, is one. Uh, so there is nothing in nature. You can't go out of your office today and see uh, financial information sitting on one side of the lawn and uh, non-financial on the other. These are agential cuts. These are separations uh, that we make. And, and to put that into focus, when we talk about people, planet and profit, these are cuts that we make, but in fact, um, we need all three to survive. Um, if we want our economic system to survive, we need capital to be rewarded, but we also need a planet in which we can live in um, and that people can uh, prosper. So the, the key point I try and make in the paper is that um, let's just be a little bit cautious about the values that we inherently pull through um, when we start saying that uh, these concepts, um, you know, are neutral and apply equally uh, to sustainability reporting as they do to financial reporting. And I think um, Carol Adams and her paper really points this out in terms of um, the kind of ill-fitting concepts that we've been um, given. And we see that manifest in the exposure draft when we see things like entity not being clearly defined. And because we know entities um, in a sustainability sense often means a supply chain. So I just wanna take you back in time to how was the conceptual framework created? And it was created um, on a set of beliefs, and this is a direct quote um, from the, the papers that uh, sit behind the True Blood Commission, uh, which was the, the, the starting point uh, of the uh, conceptual framework. And um, you can see the quote there, our social and economic system assumes that the pursuit of private goals generally tends to fulfill social ones. So what that's saying is that 
well, if companies make profit, it's a Milton Friedman view of the world, you know, the trickle down theory. Companies make profit, therefore everyone prospers, and really there's no need for governments. Uh, because, you know, essentially wealth will, will trickle down to, to everyone. Now, we know there's so much evidence that this is a false hope and actually not much trickles down. And that's why uh, we're talking about sustainable development goals and we will continue to talk about them uh, for some time, unfortunately. Um, and I think part of this thinking remains embedded in accounting and has now uh, been embedded in sustainability reporting as it's, uh, as it's gone mainstream. And the point here is that if you read a lot of the um, IFRS literature, it's all about capital markets. And to my point, um, as an accountant, uh, capital markets are not things, like companies are not things. Uh, capital markets, companies are made up of individuals and individuals within them um, making decisions. Now, I'll pick up on that in the next slide. And, you know, uh, basic finance theory tells us that, you know, our focus should be on risk and returns. That's the reason why uh, we make decisions about investing capital. And Ronnie Cohen, who's a very seasoned investor and philanthropist, says, well, actually, why don't we add a third criteria, which is impact? Uh, there's no reason, there's no God-given reason why it should be just risks and returns. We've just all accepted uh, that, oh, yes, that's what we learned in Finance 101. So what's at stake here? Um, well, what I argue is that we need a return to accountability uh, that relies on an accountee and accountor, a relationship. I can't have a relationship with a capital market. I can have a relationship with, uh, if I'm a, a company, the, the board, the CEO can have a relationship with their investors. And typically they do um, in the case of, you know, very large uh, investors. And so I believe that there is a difference between accountability where you're held to account for your actions and transparency. And this goes back to Sprague, 1920, who wrote a book, Philosophy of Accounting. And he said that accounting should go beyond uh, a description to providing an account. And what we see under transparency is a lot of descriptions, but not a lot of accounting of what's actually happened. And as long as we keep dealing with these abstractions of firms, markets, uh, capital, I think we're going to get locked into um, the same old logic that says, well, you know what, this is bad for my cash flow, so I'm just going to keep doing what I've always been doing. And the law is really clear on this point. So, you know, the courts will lift the corporate veil and hold boards and management accountable for their actions and inactions. And I think for too long in accounting, and we're at danger of doing it again uh, with sustainability reporting, is that um, we maintain those falsehoods. And what we need is to make sure that there's a through line uh, between the claims and assertions and the financial statements. There are still too many companies that report in in their sustainability report, that they're very concerned about climate change, that they think it's going to impact the, their business substantially, and yet we see no impairments to, to assets. And so I think this is where we need true integration, that we need the same narrative um, to, to line up between uh, the two different statements. Otherwise, I think we just end up with more sophisticated uh, greenwashing. Uh, Mario, and, if I may just uh, for a second, uh, we have one minute. Please, if yes. You could, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm just about done. Um, and so the key point here is, you know, and um, Shamila made the, the, the point, I, I wrote it down, um, that, 
you know, ultimately we need a society worth living in. Um, so this isn't about accounting. Accounting is not, um, it's a means, it's not an end. And I think we need to keep that really uh, in focus here because there's a danger in this discussion that we get lost uh, in the institutional arrangements. So finally, what's the solution? Well, I think the solution can be found by a different set of values. And Colin Mayer of Oxford University says purpose is therefore about finding ways of solving problems profitably where profits are defined net of costs of avoiding and remedying problems. By defining purpose and profits in this way, purpose is associated with enhancing the well-being of prosperity and prosperity of shareholders, society, and the natural world. So really, it's not a trade-off about making money about and doing good. It's really about the need for accounting to help us bring all of those three conditions uh, together. And so that should be, that accountability relationship should really be at the core of our accounting um, and, and not just uh, churning out more information. So I'll stop there um, and, um, and hand back to Mark. Thank you, Mario. Thank you. Um, I'm now delighted to uh, introduce our discussant. Uh, our discussant today is uh, David Atkin. He was appointed uh, Chief Executive Officer of the Principles for Responsible uh, Investment in December 2021, PRI. PRI is a UN-supported organization with more than 4,900 investor signatories who collectively represent over uh, 121 US trillion dollars in assets under management. Uh, so, uh, David, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, please, um, if you like to share slides, if you wish to, otherwise, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, present your views. Thanks, Mark. And no, no, no slides from me today, um, uh, but delighted to be able to join you and, and have already uh, learned an awful lot from uh, the conversation we've had this morning and uh, very much enjoyed Mario's uh, sharing his findings with us today. So I just want to start off quickly talking a little bit about the PRI and the way uh, I think it's relevant to this uh, to this audience in terms of the way we're thinking about um, our role with uh, for our signatories. So at the PRI, we've also noted a rapid uptake in the adoption of climate disclosure and reporting frameworks globally. The number of policy reforms that can potentially impact our signatories across the largest capital markets and beyond has increased from 300 in 2013 to nearly 800 in 2021 alone, and it uh, seems to be exponentially growing. In particular, sustainability disclosures are rapidly moving from optional to required in many jurisdictions as a result of emerging regulatory requirements and growing demand from investors. And these trends will surely continue to drive improvements in the future. And while there's been a significant uh, uptake in the number of reporting frameworks and initiatives, this has not solved all of the sustainability data challenges that investors face. Now, standardisation is the key for investors. Investors need more consistent, reliable and comparable sustainability data from companies to understand and assess their sustainability risks and opportunities, sustainability performance, alignment with global goals such as the Paris Agreement and the uh, SDGs, and how these influence long-term value. Investors need to understand and aggregate this data more easily, which is necessary for incorporating sustainability issues in their investment strategies policy decisions and active ownership and to meet their own growing sustainability reporting requirements. Investors operate globally and ensuring consistency and comparability of data and interoperability between different disclosure standards is essential. Now at the PRI, we're in the process of reforming our own reporting and assessment framework. The quality of our reporting must match investors' expectations and find its place within all the reporting ecosystems that exist today. This is a main, this is our sorry this our main challenge this is a, sorry this is our main challenge internally and there's a lot of work to do 
Additionally, through our driving meaningful data program, we're also working on streamlining the types of data, sources and reporting frameworks needed to support responsible investors. Now, sustainability standards can and must play a critical role in helping investors and companies to respond to sustainability issues such as climate change and to support global goals like the SDGs. In order to do so, standards should be designed to fulfil the data needs of users and preparers of sustainability information and support their decision making. This should include relevant current and forward looking information to assess sustainability risks and opportunities performance and alignment with long-term climate and wider sustainability objectives, and relevance of global and local sustainability objectives in contextualising and tracking their sustainability performance. In this context, we welcome the IFRS Foundation's newly created ISSB, which has the potential to simplify and strengthen the global sustainability reporting landscape, assuming ISSB standards are adopted across key jurisdictions. The PRI stands ready to support the important work of the ISSB by helping to build capacity within its global signatory base on the standard settings developments, as well as providing deeper insights on investor data needs and interoperability with other regional standard setting and policy initiatives. Now, as Mario notes, we may also need to move beyond the idea of the only valid investment criteria is based on risk and return. Expectations of investors from stakeholders, including beneficiaries, clients, governments, and regulators are shifting, driven by increased visibility and urgency around issues such as climate change, in income equality, and labor rights. By shaping real world outcomes alongside risk and return, investors address issues that seriously threaten the long-term performance of economies, portfolios, and the world. And to help our signatories understand how to shape outcomes, we launched our Legal Framework for Impact project, LFI. This project helps investors to understand what investing for sustainability outcomes looks like in practice, how to integrate and measure outcomes while remaining firmly grounded in fiduciary duty. The LFI report launched last summer found investors are likely to have a legal obligation to consider pursuing sustainability impact goals where it's necessary to realise their financial objectives. And finally, I'd like to highlight the PRI's research program, which supports and develops innovative, responsible investment research, showcases research findings from investor audience for an investor audience, and convenes a vibrant global community of almost 11,000 academics and investors through our academic network. We work with these experts and the next generation entering academia for our National Academic Network Conference, which will be part of PRI in person, which we hold every year in December this year in Barcelona, and to create tools and resources of high quality, independent RI evidence and insights. If you have any questions or would like to get involved, please reach out to our research team led by Catherine Ng. And with that, I'd like to end and just say thank you very much for allowing me to participate in today and uh, very happy to engage with the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're, uh, we have got a couple of more minutes before the formal sort of start of the Q&A session. And uh, I'll take the opportunity and remind, um, you know, all the participants uh, uh, and those who, are, who have joined um, uh, the, the webinar uh, to use the Q&A facility uh, to post any questions that you might have uh, for our speakers and our panelists. Um, so I will be reading out, uh, you know, a selection of those questions um, to our, um, you know, uh, panelists. And uh, if you don't mind, please identify the actual uh, person you would like uh, to address your question to. Thank you. And um, whilst uh, questions are flowing in uh, or should do uh, shortly, I will perhaps um, start by asking a question myself. And uh, I would like to address this question uh, to David. Uh, David Atkin, please, if I may. Um, just uh, reflecting on, uh, on, on, on your vantage point, uh, you know, the, the position where you are from your position. Uh, what do you see as an appetite for uh, this sort of uh, unified reporting framework as far as sustainable reporting is concerned? Uh, the appetite uh, emanating from 
uh, you know, from the investment community. This is a very sort of vibrant uh, investment community, isn't it? Uh, you know, community of um, asset managers. There are all different sorts and types. Uh, what are you hearing uh, from them as what the ideal um, situation as far as sustainability reporting is concerned uh, is would be for them? How would that advantage or potentially challenge their practice? And also, how would that uh, trickle down, if at all, to the actual end beneficiaries, to the end stakeholders whose, uh, whose money they are managing or on whose behalf they are investing? Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so uh, I think the short answer to your question is that for, and the appetite from investors uh, is, I think, very strong. I think there's been real... I mean, so we are seeing the RI uh, movement become very much mainstream. Sustainability is very much mainstream now. But, you know, one of the complaints that you hear in every forum is the lack of ability, you know, is the competing or the seemingly competing reporting frameworks uh, and the inability to be able to have, um, be able to uh, compare apples with apples. And so there's a plethora of data but um, there is a real uh, frustration of not being able to take that information and be able to line it up with other, um, you know, uh, in a way that enables uh, that comparison and to identify well, which, co which companies are the ones who are uh, where there's insight and you can see value from the reporting to it's just um, noise or, you know, uh, marketing. Uh, so the whole sort of greenwashing component. So there's a real, uh, I think there's a real desire for the, uh, the recent announcements to continue with momentum, noting though that there are very real challenges in how this is all put together and how it all works. So I guess what we bring to the table is an investor voice so that as these standards are being developed, that they do very much keep in mind the, uh, the, the investor um, uh, perspective. Um, but even within the investor perspectives, and your question goes to this as well, is that there are a range of uh, views, as you would expect in such a diverse group of, um, of, of, uh, of players, uh, around, you know, debates around um, enterprise value, around um, uh, out, uh, impact and outcomes, around double materiality. There is uh, a very broad range of uh, of perspectives around that. And I'll just finish off with this last point, Mark, which is one of the reasons why the PRI will be conducting a formal consultation around our mission and purpose in the second half of this year, because our principles and our mission and purpose were developed in 2006. The world has changed significantly. Uh, and we want to see whether there, need, there needs to be any revision of our, um, of our mission and purpose based on a changing world that we're in. Uh, and to see how much divergence and convergence there is in our community. Uh, so that's something that I'll be undertaking later on this year. And uh, I think that will be a very interesting exercise for all of us. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, much appreciate it. Thank you, David. Um, one question in the Q&A here is for Mario, but uh, perhaps David can share his, his thoughts from the investor perspective. So. Uh, thinking about the objectives of um, IFRSs, right, and uh, fundamentally they focus on usefulness of information to investors, and you know the focus is on transparency. Uh, the question to to uh, Mario is: Is he more arguing for the stewardship and ac accountability to become more the main objective uh, for standard setting process, um, and then? If, if that's Mario's view, how does it um, uh, compare with uh, David's view, uh, I guess? Mario first, for me. I, I would go for Mario and then- Okay, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Mario, you are on mute. That we did. Yeah, yeah, it had to happen. <laughs> Uh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and, and to go to David's point about um, investors having a fiduciary duty, um, I usually start with my master's students and I ask them this question, what is fiduciary duty? Which, you know, 
you would think all business students would know the answer to. And um, most of the time, nobody in the classroom is able to answer that question. And, and I think it means that we've actually lost some um, fundamental premises here in terms of um, what accounting and what business is all about. And so, yes, I think IFRS should have a focus on uh, stewardship and accountability. It's not just about providing uh, any information. It's what Ijiri, in my article, I quote Ijiri, uh, a US academic uh, in the 1950s and 60s. And he says, you know, in the real world, it's you and I. It's, it's not you and a capital market. You know, so we do need to get back to, in my view, uh, accountability. So if management makes assertions or claims that, you know, we're going to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by X percent, then there's an accountability to actually do that. Uh, unfortunately, at the moment, and um, we did a study on this at WBCSD, uh, when you look at claims, and you look at, well, what happened after that claim? And often it's never to be found again. You know, a statement was made, uh, a lot of press releases, a lot of energy, and then uh, it disappears. And, and I think we've just got to change that. Because uh, if we're serious about sustainable development, um, if we're serious about climate change, if we're serious about alleviating the, um, incredible societal problems that, you know, we have, then we've got to get serious about this stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Over to you. Um, so I would completely agree with Mario. Uh, I think that um, that accountability piece is, I think, we're now beginning to see the architecture be put in place. Um, as imperfect as it might be, um, but we're seeing, I think, that well, certainly the, 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 the standard setting piece, you know, is, is, is now um, coming together. But we're also seeing um, the regulatory um, uh, initiatives or the, re the legislation and the regulation uh, start to create, um, I think, the ability to hold in, uh, investors uh, to account for the claims that they're making around sustainability. Uh, and, uh, and it's one of the reasons why from our own reporting and assessment, which is one of our accountability measures, every signatory must provide a report every year on the work they're doing in RI. Um, but it's one of the reasons why we're, we're having to just uh, review because um, when we started in 2006, there effectively was no, none of this um, re regulatory overlay. Now, uh, investors are being required to respond, depending on the jurisdiction, um, a multitude of potential uh, regulatory obligations. Um, and so we're just thinking about what's our role uh, compared to what's uh, being put in place. We want to make sure that the regulatory overlay, though, is uh, actually... Um, uh, is cognizant of the investor uh, world. Sometimes uh, the regulations ha has good intent, but uh, in the implementation is um, uh, often lacks a little bit of insight. Um, but also back to that point about accountability. I mean, as uh, when we in the investment community, in the pension fund, you have fiduciary responsibility to make sure you are making decisions that are in the best interests of your um, members. Uh, and I think this is why this question around that we've done around the LSI is really important so that uh, trustees don't uh, recognise that part of that responsibility includes looking at the externalities that could impact uh, on financial performance uh, uh, that you deliver to your, uh, to your members. So I think this is a really interesting space and we're going to see a lot more uh, focus in the coming years. Right. Thank you very much, both. Um, there is one question in the chat actually was put earlier on. Perhaps this can be addressed by Begona and or Samila. And then, of course, David and Mario can can share their views. Um, it is about the issue that you, you didn't. Uh, it is interesting that you didn't mention or I probably missed it about materiality 
Okay, and uh, one attendee here talks about whether we should have different materiality for you know sustainability issues and different for um, you know financial uh, reporting issues, and then um, you know whether this should be you know uh, available just in the discretion of preparers, or there should be some clear gui guidance out there. So. Um, I don't know if, if uh, Begonia or, or Samira want to start and then others can, can see them. Yeah. Well, Janis, that's it. I, w I read it also in the chat, but the materiality point, uh, question. Well, in my view, materiality is, is, is a concept that helps to decide what to report from the company to the outside. So it's not financial, it's not it's not uh, sustainability, it's just a, it's, a, it's a criteria to decide what should be included in the information, corporate reporting in general. It could be financial sustainability, but I'm unhappy with this word use as double materiality. This is why I prefer to refer to inside out, outside in, because to me, materiality is something else. So once I said that, well, I think that uh, it's important if we are measuring the value of the company, then financial thing, financial impacts are relevant. And then there should be a criteria to decide when they may affect the investor decisions. And this is what the ISB, IASB has been doing when producing this, um, well, not standards, but uh, uh, I don't remember the word for these documents issued practice statement in order to help preparers what to do when they to prepare the financial reporting. Similarly, if we now talk about sustainability reporting, then we talk about how the company is affecting the environment, the society, the planet, and then, well, how these externalities that have not been taken into account are now taken into account, although not in monetary terms. But yes, we need to have some criteria but the problem here, in my view, is that now we don't have a, a model that might help to decide how, what are the users, the stakeholders, sorry, to do with this information. While when we talk about financial reporting, we have this rational investor in mind and the financial uh, models that might help to decide what might be useful to produce to, to estimate future cash flow. So, Leaving that aside, now we have a problem about what are the, the needs of the stakeholders and how, which impacts are relevant for them. But yes, we need a criteria for materiality that will be different to the one for that impacts outside, inside out, sorry. We need a criteria. It would be good to have a criteria that, that, uh, that uh, helps in preparers to do the, the, the reports and that, help the stakeholders to make their own decisions or to, or to have the information they need for their own purposes. So that's my short or long answer about that. Thank you. Thank you, Begonia. I don't know if someone else wants to share their views here. Uh, I'm happy to. This is my favorite topic. Um, I agree with Begonia. Uh, materiality is materiality. Um, and I think there's a lot of confusion. I mean, materiality is an aspect of relevance. And what we're trying to do with materiality is we're trying to select from the universe of information, um, information that is relevant for the end user. Typically, financial statements under company law are drawn up for investors and capital providers uh, more generally, so uh, debt and equity. So that's... That's, that's all materiality is. So when people start talking about double and dynamic, I'm, I think they're talking about something else. So I think we need to separate the concept of materiality from the application of materiality. And there are different ways you can apply um, materiality. So GRI applies materiality in, um, in an inductive way. So you go and ask your stakeholders what's material versus um, I4S where it's done deductively, where you start from the reasonable person test um, and what does a reasonable investor. 
So, so I think we just need to clarify what we mean. And then the other point there is that it's not up to the company usually to make a materiality judgment. Um, typically, governments, uh, as we have in Europe through the CSRD or the proposed CSRD and the transposition of that international legislation, governments in, in Spain, in the UK, well, sorry, UK is no longer, but we have the same framework. Um, you know, uh, what we see is government says, you know what, human rights, gender equality, all these topics, social and environmental topics, are, in, are important, therefore you must report them. So they're taken out of the whole materiality decision-making. And, and I, think, um, I think we're putting too many eggs in the one basket and hoping that materiality will kind of save the day. Um, and, and it's really just a tool to select information, but often that selection is going to be made by policymakers, and I think that's that's important not to kind of overstate um, the principle. Thank you, thank you, Mario. Um, I, we have uh, a few questions in our uh, Q and A um, sort of uh, stream of questions. Um, I would uh, read out uh, um, uh, one or two questions, uh, time allowing. Uh, so one question is um, uh, from uh, Pankaj Kapoor. Um, reporting and disclosure requirements uh, shall be in line with the core essence, but more emphasis shall be given to actions, both in letter and spirit, because only pacts and standards are not enough. That is, reporting is, uh, is a mean rather than an end. Uh, there is a need to act according to pact in order to make an impact. How an action in spirit can be assured. So I believe the question is mostly about assurance of, um, of uh, that information that would be produced. I'm not sure who would like to um, you know, offer a, a view or a position on, on that question. Perhaps, um, uh, perhaps um, Mario, you could uh, go first if you wish. Sure, sure. And as part of the IAASB's um, task force uh, looking at the assurance of sustainability information, which led to uh, the IAASB issuing guidance on this topic. And I think um, one, there's a few kind of nested problems here. One is that um, assurance of this information is absolutely vital. If an investor was told, here's the financial statements, they haven't been assured by a third party um, but just trust us. I mean, most investors would balk at that and say, well, no, you go off and get assurance and actually it's required by law. Uh, same is true for sustainability information. Uh, and there, there are no, and that was something that um, in the work that IAASB did, uh, there are no real um, uh, problems or barriers to assuring this sort of information. Um, the issue often comes is in the lack of suitable criteria. So standards aren't specific enough. And so companies are required to then develop their own accounting policies. And that's what leads to uh, the, the divergence of practices. But assurance, in my view, is absolutely critical. Um, and, and it can be done and it is done. And I think it is an important part of um, improving the quality of, of information. And one final point, if you look at uh, the work that research done by academics who've looked at financial disasters, um, one of the kind of universals that comes out of that is you need a healthy ecosystem. It's not just about the standards. It's not just about the regulators. It's not just about the behavior of preparers or, or auditors. It takes the whole ecosystem. So to David's point about that infrastructure is being created, uh, it is being created and we now need all the different actors, whether it's academics, whether it's regulators, all of us need to play a part in actually now strengthening uh, this infrastructure. 
because standards or assurance um, alone are not going to solve this problem. And, and you can go through Wirecard, you know, so many scandals uh, that have lost um, so much wealth in our societies, um, all because the infrastructure had a, a kind of broken link in the chain. Thank you, Mario. Uh, may I also uh, bring in uh, Shamila, please, uh, with regard to this question? I believe you, you, you have uh, plenty of experience on the uh, topic of assurance uh, as far as integrated reporting in South Africa is concerned. Uh, Shamila, would you like to uh, say a few things? Hi, Mark. Sorry, my, my camera's Thank off. You. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, very well. Thank you. Sorry about that. We're having a bit of an issue with the connectivity, so I'm dropping in and out. You know, um, I think largely do agree with Mario's points and looking at assurance, but at this point, I think I actually want to not comment because it's a landscape that's evolving quite a bit at the moment and there is a bit of flux on it. So I think for this point, I think it's just safer that I don't comment also because we're in the process right now of with our own disclosure guidance considering these issues. And so I just, I just prefer not to comment right now until we've actually finalized our perspective on it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Shamila. And David, sorry. Yeah. Yes, uh, please. So philosophically, I completely agree with what Mario said. Um, uh, and certainly in the pension fund that I ran in Australia for 13 years, CBUS, where we were doing our own integrated reporting, uh, that was a really important point for us, that we, we were looking to validate the claims that we were making in our integrated report uh, that had uh, some uh, external assurance that sat around it because we thought that was a really important part of the credibility piece um, and would enable uh, confidence to be provided to our, um, to our various stakeholders. I, I do get though that it's going to take, I mean, this is, this is a, a work in progress. Uh, and, you know, I think inevitably that's where we will end up. Um, how long it takes us there, I'm, I'm not quite sure. And I do recognise that there are, you know, there are substantive issues um, because, you know, you can't just flip the switch and, and go into this overnight. It just, it takes, you know, certainly from my experiences in, in an organisation, several iterations before you get the confidence levels that you are prepared to then have that assurance externally. Thank you, David. Thank you. Um, I think we have a couple more minutes and I will ask uh, one more question, if I may. Uh, that's uh, by uh, Martin in the um, Q&A uh, uh, floor questions. So the draft uh, IFRA uh, guidance requires a topic to be called material if the impact is global. How useful is it to call climate change and ozone depleting substances to always be cold material, irrespective of the magnitude of the emissions? Um, I think this is a broad question and um, I potentially uh, would ask uh, maybe Begona if, uh, if you would like to um, um, reflect on this question. Uh, really, I, I need to think about it because it's true that uh, things with a global impact might be more material than others that are focused on one particular place. But uh, I think that we need to think a bit more about which, how large is the, the this global impact. And and before making decisions about if these things should be reported or not. But going back to the prior comment about the assurance, I, I would like to say something as well. I, I agree with this case with Mario that this information would be ideally be assured. And this is the purpose of the, the this is the plan according to the, uh, the directive, to the proposal of directive. But I think that we, we, the accountants, the auditors, or the assurers, we don't have all the responsibility about what's going to happen with the, with the planet. And much more things should be also done, such as well, taxation, enforcement, things like that, that are also very important in order to achieve if we want to have sustainable uh, uh, sustainability for the future. So I think that we have to play our role, but others have to do some 
complementary things to achieve the, the, the ending purpose. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Begon. Thank you very much. Um, in the interest of time, I would like to uh, move on to our uh, next uh, session, and that is uh, that is our actual uh, our plenary uh, this time. Um, and I'm uh, handing over to Professor Carol Adams. Uh, thank you, Mark. I'm just trying to escape from my full screen here. Um, so that was really a very interesting quest, um, uh, discussion, and I'm sure that our plenary presenters will have quite a lot to say on these topics uh, too. Um, I was um, interested in David's comments on standardization and the discussion on assurance in the light of the um, ISSB's exposure draft on the general disclosures, because I struggle to see how that will actually do, um, do will help with assurance or achieve standardization. Um, and also, you know, materiality, um, I think financial materiality, in my view, it's, it, I, I, it's difficult to see how that can be determined before an organization has determined its material impacts through GRI standards. So we have all that um, coming up and an excellent um, panel for you um, today. So thank you very much for joining us, Elko, Judy, Jeff and Esther. And I'd like to acknowledge each of your um, huge contributions to this um, field of sustainability re reporting and, and standard setting. Um, so the questions that Subash and I um, want to ask you are informed by the concerns that have been raised by academics, largely in response to the IFRS Foundation Trustees consultation paper on sustainability reporting. And um, uh, so we, we've heard quite a few of these concerns already, but there were 39 responses to this consultation that came from um, academics, a total of 104 academic signatories across 74 universities or academic networks and 20 countries. And those responses are all publicly available. I've put the, the link in the, in the chat. And I've analyzed them with um, a colleague from Durham University, Professor um, Frank, Frank Muller. And we found that the majority of these responses were quite strongly opposed to the proposals on really key issues. Um, and many of the signatories to these um, opposed um, contributions have substantial research records in accounting in general or, and sustainability reporting and its outcomes and consequences in particular. And those minority that were overall supportive of the IFRIS Foundation's involvement in the space, um, nevertheless raised some quite significant concerns about the proposals in the, in the consultation paper. Now, of course, we can't extrapolate from the, that, the, those responses to the whole population of accounting academics, but nevertheless, they raise some um, useful evidence-based um, uh, concerns um, that I think are very relevant to uh, policymakers um, in, in, this, in this area. And it was an unusually high response rate uh, from, from academics. So it just shows that the, the strength of some of the concerns there. Um, so overall, they were strongly supportive of there being mandatory reporting on a, 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 and accountability for the impacts of organizations on economy, society, and the environment. And that and that ability to work within um, planetary boundaries. What they were concerned about was assumptions that there is an investor perspective that all investors share. And I think David touched on that, um, you know, saying that there were some differences there. And there were concerns about limiting the audience for reporting on sustainability issues to those with a financial stake. The definition of materiality got a lot of concern and also the climate uh, first approach. 
uh, that you know the, the research over the over the decades that I've talked about has, has looked at corporate motivations for what is reported, what's not reported in sustainability reporting, the internal process of the organization, the quality of that reporting, how reporting and accounting more broadly makes some some matters visible and others invisible, as, as, Mar as Mario alluded to, and how reporting frameworks influence corporate priorities and the implication of that for sustainable development. And that is really important. And that is what a lot of the concern is about here, that if the, if the emphasis is on financial materiality, then um, sustainable development goes out of the window and if the proposals are unclear, um, allow a lot of judgment um, on terms which aren't well defined, as seems to be the case to me in the exposure draft on general um, purpose uh, disclosures, then that leaves things really open for a lot of uh, greenwashing and you don't get that harmonization. Uh, some academics were troubled by the lack of analysis of existing and desirable structures for sustainability reporting and the assumption that the IFRIS um, Foundation was best placed to do it when, um, you know, that there isn't that um, multi-stakeholder approach that uh, the GRI has, which, um, which was, was, which was favoured. And also noting that governments who are going to be implementing reporting requirements are also um, you know, accountable for and have to report on, they've signed up to report on their progress against the UN SDGs. Um, so a, a major contention or, amongst the um, academics was the conceptual framework, the talk of financial materiality, cash flows and enterprise value. And researchers know that messaging uh, really influences corporate efforts. You know, where do, where do those efforts go? Um, so the concern is that the conceptual framing, where it doesn't address sustainable development, um, is going to be interpreted as a sort of business largely unusual approach and we just get on with that thinking about profit and cash flows in the way that we always always have and putting that first um, and so this of course will have a negative impact on sustainable development and hence long-term returns and it will encourage, encourage um, you know a lack of accountability on those issues um, and the impacts on sustainable development. So mainstream accounting research has highlighted the political nature of accounting practices, that accounting is not simply a technical tool that gives you the correct answer, but it's a tool um, that's influenced by the powerful and that can have unintended consequences. And so that's where the academic community has you know, some real expertise in being able to assess what those unintended consequences might be. And I'm putting greenwashing there as, as, as number one when you're focusing on financial materiality. So when it comes to sustainability reporting for enterprise value, the range of interpretations of that investor perspective, um, you know, that, that's pretty significant. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a concern. So to my mind, these issues, they've not been um, resolved by the exposure, exposure draft on general um, disclosure requirements. The emphasis is there on financial materiality in determining what's referred to as baseline standards. There's no reference to GRI's impact standards. And many of us would think that you can't get to what's financially material, as I said, this is really the key issue, I think unless you've looked at the um, impacts of the organization on societies, the environment and economies. Now, as before we start the discussion, as a community academics, we use evidence in giving such input. We're open to our evidence being respectfully challenged um, by other evidence. And with that, I'm going to pass over to um, Subash to, um, to pose the first question. Uh, thank you, Carol. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, remind uh, participants to post their questions to the panelists in the Q&A section rather than in the chat section, if you can, please. Uh, 
So I would like to ask a few questions from the panelists first and also um, encourage the participants to ask uh, questions through the Q&A function, which we will then direct to the panelists. So I would like to direct the first question to Elko. Uh, now this question draws from the stuff that was uh, discussed uh, in the earlier sessions, as well as uh, some of the things raised by um, the participants in the Q&A section earlier. So we know that the scientific community has expressed concerns about, <coughs> sorry, mandating only the standards that would be issued by the International Sustainability Standards Board or ISSP. One of these concerns is that standards that focus on enterprise value alone will be inc incompatible with the commitments uh, of governments to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals and will therefore encourage greenwashing and SDG washing. <clears throat> also, they might not even fully uh, address or uh, satisfy investor information needs that these standards are expected to cater for. To overcome these concerns, sustainability standards should embrace double materiality. So this was uh, what was discussed earlier. How can these limitations of the ISSP standards be addressed by policymakers and reporting companies? What are your views on this, Elko? Uh, thank you for the question and thank you uh, for having me here. Um, I think, well, of course, we will help the uh, ISSB uh, as we're already doing. But I think before I, I go into your questions, let's let's put it in a bit of a broader uh, perspective. I'm I'm currently here in Davos, and uh, what struck me is that even the basic knowledge of many participants here, being large businesses, uh, consultants, bankers, financiers, on the very basics of sustainability is, is not there. Uh, I guess that if you would have a, um, uh, you, you would ask a question here, you do a survey on all the participants. I guess that around 90% could not mention 10 out of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals that you can see behind, uh, behind Esther. Uh, so uh, perhaps we also in, in the more academic environment should be aware with a lack of knowledge and understanding of the very basics why we are doing this. And we are doing this basically all because we want to build a, a, a healthier and, and happier planet for all of us. So that's the basis why we're doing this. And, and there's still a lot to win and a lot to gain uh, in order to win the hearts. And when you win the hearts, uh, people usually start to, to act upon it. Uh, which brings me to, to answering your question, uh, which I uh, summarize as uh, if only the financial side of reporting uh, is mandatory, then it may very well be that the sustainability side or the impact side will not be executed upon. Um, uh, uh, and then with a typical answer that is very unsatisfactory, I think the answer is yes and no. And let me explain you what I mean by yes and no. It very much depends on the type of organization you are dealing with. There are many organizations that put a serious effort in uh, making the world a better place, in investing in socioeconomic cohesion in environmental issues and report on it. The, the 11,000 or something uh, businesses that, that, that voluntarily report under the GRI standards are, are, are a proof of that. That doesn't mean that the reports they file are always correct. Eh? We've seen a recent case with fail that is completely uh, uh, GRI compliant. However, they have some issues with really executing upon it, which brings indeed the assurance and the mandatory part of assurance in play. Personally, <clears throat> I think that a combination of mandatory assurance and CMI or, or perhaps not even mandatory reporting on the topic uh, uh, could be as useful as, as, as implementing legislation that makes impact reporting mandatory. And what we also now see, so that is more look at the outcome instead of the law itself. So if you publish your report, you must have in place your internal monitoring and control system to evidence that what you report is right. As the SEC ruled, in case of fail, 
uh, 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 you were reporting on your endeavors on a safe workplace and uh, uh, against water pollution, but in fact, you did the contrary. So uh, investors, you have, a, you have a fair claim to ask for a compensation because basically they fooled you. And if you can prove that you made this decision to invest in them based on their sustainability report, you should be compensated. So I think there, 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 there are some pressure points here besides just making it mandatory and making it work. So we have we have mandatory by law. We have voluntarily that's currently happening already. And there is now th something that is in between. That's the third one that is investor pressure, as you may have seen with the famous Amazon case. And is it the 25th today? No, it's 23rd today. A uh, group of, of, of investors, very uh, short summary, uh, asked uh, Amazon to start reporting under GRI 207. And Amazon said basically, no, that's not a good idea. Uh, Gibson Dunn came with a legal reason why that should not be the case. And then there was this open letter by a group of investors that said, well, we think it should be brought to vote. And the SEC said, yes, it can be brought to vote. Uh, by the way, the, the, the consolidated capital uh, invested by the co-signatories of that letter was 3.6 trillion US dollars. So although not mandatory by law, and but most certainly it's not voluntarily, because if this amount of investment capital pushes you to bring something to vote because it's deemed important, then companies will listen and follow. So now it's on tax, but I, I can predict you that many more of these things will follow. And then the, th the, then the fourth pillar in there, is I would say indeed the mandatory assurance and not limited assurance, but reasonable assurance upon reports issued voluntarily or not voluntarily on sustainability. And because the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And as, as I believe it was Mario that said, if you would go to an investor and say, here are my financial accounts, by the way, they have not been audited. You have to trust me on my blue eyes then they would say, are you completely nuts? Of course not. So when it comes to important topics as sustainability, that for more and more an integrated part of large businesses, their strategies, you would accept exactly the same. Here's my sustainability report. It has not been audited. And by the way, the standards we made up ourselves, um, that, 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 that some do. To cut a long story short, um, I do not believe that we can only achieve our objectives by mandatory, by law, by mandatory reporting. I think there are many steps in between. It also depends on, on the cultural background of the countries we're dealing with, the regulators we're dealing with, and the political realities that we see. In some countries, this will just not happen. In the United States, this will not happen. Not now, not in 10 years, not in 25 years. Impact reporting will not become mandatory. I'll have a bet with you on a on a magnum vintage champagne, whatever, in 25 years we drink it together, that that will not happen. So there are other means also to make sure that companies report uh, uh, on impacts uh, the best as they can. Thank you. Yeah, I, th I you know, I think um, Elko, the, the views there that academics have are, are particularly relevant to large organizations that have not reported on their impacts. You know, and as you say, they're, they're spending a lot of resources on financial reporting, um, but not reporting on those major impacts that have been quite damaging. And that is, um, that is really where the concern lies. And this notion that, um, you know, reporting financial materiality of sustainability issues could become mandatory before reporting on those impacts. And, you know, that, that question around, can you really know what's financially material unless you've looked at your impacts? And perhaps we could turn to Esther there uh, because um, Esther, your company does all kinds of different reporting, really good using all the different frameworks. You've never had a problem um, doing that. You've been a pioneer there. Um, how do you um, how do you see this looking at it from a financial materiality perspective? Could you do that if you didn't already know what your impacts on society and the environment were? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for having me and hello from Singapore. Uh, well, I think that we have learned a lot just now from various speakers. And uh, I think mandatory reporting started actually in Singapore in 2017, but uh, we started our reporting in 2008 uh, using GRI standard at that time. And our life was much simpler 15 years ago. We just basically look at, you know, more philanthropy, and also, you know, uh, very qualitative measurement. But over time, we really see the needs and, uh, you know, the, the, the rising expectation for more quantitative, you know, approach. And uh, we actually adopted uh, GRI, um, UNGC 10 principle. And in 2015, we actually added uh, uh, CDP, which is actually carbon disclosure. And why CDP, uh, 2010, we added uh, CDP. Why CDP is because of our uh, real estate sector has very high carbon uh, footprint. And uh, also the, uh, you know, three years later, we have the global real estate sustainability benchmark. And, uh, then IR, you know, we look at, we put on the financial and business lens to look at the ESG using the six capital, which is very, very useful for us to connect, you know, I mean, ESG in the good old day, we're all talking about non-financial. And then, but I think using the financial lens to look at ESG, it really helps us to look at whether our product, our practices, our organization are really creating positive or, 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 or negative impact. And what are all these capital, you know, impact on the financial. And of course, SDG come about in, you know, 2016, we started embracing nine goals and now 14 goals now. And when we say embrace doesn't mean we write a check, you know, then we can actually embrace it, you know, as, as poverty or whatever. We look at what are material to us, the ESG issue, we started materiality study since 2014. That is very useful because it helped us to set our direction. What are the issues that we should look at? And we match it with what are the risks and what are the opportunity? And when we say risk, we also me we measure uh, reputation risk and financial risk as well. And we look at opportunities, whether we can actually not just mitigate, but adapt, you know, uh, adaptation approach to create uh, new technology, new solutions. And uh, then we, of course, bring in TCFT in 2017 because climate risks are definitely uh, investment and business risks. And uh, SPTI as well, and SSB and CDSB in 2020 and 2021. And we, it's not like we are very free. We want to bring in all these together. It's actually, there is actually feedback also, you know, when we interact with our internal stakeholder and external stakeholder. When we say external stakeholder, it is actually very diverse from regulators, and uh, policy makers, um, you know, uh, supplier, and uh, of course, you know, our clients, our, you know, uh, um, uh, financial, financial as well, especially when we issued Green Bond in uh, 2017. And after that, it was really, really fast and the financial, you know, FI asked a lot, a lot of information. So I think it's all a progressive, you know, journey that we have over time to learn that there's actually really financial impact of ESG. And uh, we conducted TCFD um, uh, uh, recommendations of uh, climate change scenario planning since 2017. And uh, 2018, we did our first one based on two degree. And because of you know, IPCC recommending 1.5, we actually started another one, the second one. And in 2020, when we finished the second one, then we were hit by COVID. There's a lot that we need to do. So we started the third one, which has, you know, look at the cost of disruption, the cost of, you know, supply, you know, uh, disruption and workers disruption. So there are a lot that we have learned over time, especially today. It's very complex. Sustainability is so complex that we don't just look at directly climate risk, but also what are the climate risks that affected the whole value chain, the whole ecosystem. And we can't ignore the fact that it has social impact. It has a lot of impact on our business as well that has financial impact in the end of the day. Yeah. A very uh, long answer, for, so sorry. <laughs> thanks for that, Esther. That's, uh, that was very insightful. Um, I would like to ask the next question, which is quite related to the one that was just answered by Esther from Jeff. Um, so academic research indicates that the, a focus on investors will not lead to uh, change within organizations. And planetary boundaries must be considered by uh, reporters and standard setters. 
So therefore, an important question is what's, what um, responsibility do sustainability reporting standard setters have with respect to facilitating versus hindering the achievement of sustainable development, uh, which goes back to the very first question as well. In other words, should sustainability standards also encourage organizational change to transform their approach to sustainability? Uh, Jeff, as an academic and uh, the chair of SASPI, can you please share your thoughts in response to these questions? Yeah, thanks. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really important question. Um, the way I think about this is that um, if, if we're stuck in a world where trying to address things from a financial perspective are just going to hinder the efforts towards sustainable development, then we're in a real bind, uh, you know, because we basically have two major forces kind of fighting uh, against the, you know, the, a common purpose. But the way I think about it is that that sustainable development is is often aligned with shareholder value, but um, but it doesn't make those two things the same thing. And I think that's really important to remember when I think about what we need for sustainable development. There are things that, as a society. Uh, we're going to need to expect of companies, of citizens, of, of governments, regardless of, of, of you know, whether there's a, a business case to be made uh, profitably around it. Some things are going to be costly and need to be imposed. Uh, when you think about trying to address the issues uh, that investors care about, uh, I know Carol has said this several times in, in her writings and, and, and today, that I, and I totally agree, you cannot really consider all of the, the financially material sustainability issues without thinking about the impacts that a company has. And that's one of the places that as we've been working for the last decade to develop SASB standards, one of the first things we start with is what is a company doing? What are the externalities of that company's business activities? It's where, it's where we start. Um, now, we also think that there are dependencies uh, as well that are, are really important, right? If, uh, if you happen to live uh, you know, hold properties and assets near uh, shores where there are rising sea levels. It doesn't matter if you caused that, uh, you're going to be affected by it, and it has to be addressed as well. So, you know, the way I think about this is that we don't want a world where these two things are hindered, uh, you know, like the, where they're fighting against a common purpose. But we also have to recognize in, in some ways that, that they're not doing entirely the same thing. And what investors are going to need to know about, for example, they're going to want to know about uh, what are the implications for a company's expenses or, or, or profits? Uh, uh, what are the risks that are, are related to the, this type of, you know, to addressing the sustainability issue, whether they caused it or not? And, you know, in, if it's a situation where things are really well aligned, where they can improve their profits or reduce their risk by addressing a sustainability issue, great. That's going to be a situation where the market, a market focus is going to complement regulatory efforts to accomplish organizational change towards sustainable development. And there is empirical evidence of this. Uh, uh, at, a, at another event that Carol uh, helped put together, uh, I talked about uh, research in, uh, in the Journal of Accounting and Economics, looking at mine safety and how mine safety didn't really improve after disasters or regulation or disclosure, getting to the point from earlier today about transparency versus accountability, uh, until actually uh, these, this information around imminent danger orders got put into the 10 case in the US uh, as, as part of Sarbanes-Oxley, actually. Or sorry, not Sarbanes-Oxley, Dodd-Frank. Uh, so a financially oriented regulation. And so there's a case where you, know, you do see improvements in the impacts uh, uh, you know, that are being imposed on, on, on workers uh, as a result of a financial focus, getting the hands into uh, that investors need uh, you know, into you know, a disclosure and a time and a place where they can actually, where markets can actually act on that financially material information. So, so there is an opportunity to, to try to address those things. If you, if you ignore that, if you, you at the other day, like you can't, you can't look to markets to solve the most challenging issues. For example, if addressing sustainable development is gonna be very costly and potentially risky, and all we do is try to get that emphasis into financial reports, I would worry that that would just make markets price those companies that are least likely to address it, that it could exacerbate the problem. Disclosure doesn't always help. Look at executive compensation. 
we thought we needed to shed a light on it. And once we did, it started to skyrocket, right? And so, you know, probably for, for interesting reasons, we could talk about another day. But, uh, you know, I think that these are important issues. They're not the same. Uh, and, uh, and we should look at who's using the information and make sure that we get them the information that they need and recognize there's a lot of overlap here. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I might ask the next question from Judy. Um, IESSB is proposing a building block approach, sorry, building blocks approach. Uh, they expect that the standards they produce will meet the global baseline of sustainability disclosures for the capital markets. The ISSP signed an MOU with uh, the GRI to work towards uh, reducing duplication in disclosure requirements for uh, efficiently implementing this building's block, uh, building blocks approach. So I would like to see Judy's view on this issue. Judy, how effective do you think is a building blocks approach which segregates the information needs of investors and other stakeholders from the points of view of report preparers and investors? So if you focus on report preparers and investors, that would be great. Sure, thank you very much. And um, thank you for having me at this very interesting conference and, and for sharing the, um, the papers as well um, uh, that we've been talking about. Uh, I mean, I think, so one thing to say is that the, um, the agreement between the ISSB and GRI is in its early stages right now. And we are just beginning the, the technical dialogue um, between the two organizations specifically to puzzle out um, what does this look like in uh, in substance? Um, so 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 very much remains to be uh, determined about that. But what we have um, explicitly stated is the desire to align definitions, um, work programs wherever we reasonably can, so that, um, for example, uh, both institutions might be working on biodiversity in about the same time scale, so that we can affect a kind of um, uh, the extent of uh, harmonization possible, you know, quite efficiently. Um, <clears throat> and um, the, I, I think th these, these things will help us to define what the building blocks might actually consist of. Um, my, um, my, my caution that, that I would uh, sort of put, put into the mix here is that um, uh, despite the, uh, the, the good intentions um, are, are around um, trying to advance this um, uh, alignment between um, uh, different uh, reporting institutions and frameworks that has been taking place over, over the last few years. Um, I, I think when we, when we get really down to the substance of it, the language of building blocks doesn't actually sort of bear out in the, in the wider conversation that we have um, ar around these issues. So um, for, for, for building blocks to be solid, they kind of need to be the same thing, you know, from one, from one framework to the next. Um, whereas matter of fact, we've really been talking about materiality. We've been talking about the scope of topics that, that might be interesting for, for, for different stakeholders. We've not really been talking about um, very consistent, explicit disclosures from one context to another. Of course, you know, if we're talking about measuring greenhouse gas emissions or something like that, there does need to be a global standard for, for doing that. And of course there is. The, the, the challenge comes when we try to bake that into um, <clears throat> organizational sustainability reporting standards that have different uh, constructions uh, and 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 different um, uh, and and different purposes and that sort of gets to the to the question that you've asked here about uh, uh, segmenting uh, information for the the use of investors versus other stakeholders and and how and how useful is that I mean, I think there's a really big bear trap that we need to avoid falling into here, which is the which is the assumption that investors are all one thing. They are not. They are they are a highly diverse uh, sort of um, global body of of people and and institutions. Some are involved in debt markets, you know, uh, and kind of bonds. Some are involved in listed equities. Some are involved in private equity. Some are involved in pension funds. It's sort of some, some do hedging and volatility strategies and all kinds of things that don't 
really have have any relationship to uh, individual organizational behavior or performance beyond the uh, sort of the, the, the finance uh, elements. Um, and therefore trying to even just to sort of define investors for the purposes of sustainability reporting is a bit of a fool's errand in, in, in my in my view, which is um, uh, which is reflective of, of GRI's approach to uh, defining uh, its own um, sort of scope of activity, which is um, in relation to the impacts that organizations have on people, on uh, society, the environment and the economy. Um, <clears throat> regardless of whatever the, the financial consequences of those impacts might be. Um, and, and as Carol has, has very ably made the point, it is very much GRI's view that you, you must comprehend those impacts. You must be able to name them and to identify the sort of nature, location, the magnitude of those impacts in order to have some understanding of which ones are associated with some financial consequence and what those might be in, in different circumstances. So I think the, 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 the sort of their, the short answer to your, to your question really is that the, um, the, the building blocks language obliges us still to do a great deal of work really to uh, ju just, just to sort of, um, uh, ju just to sort of talk about um, at the kind of um, uh, framework level um, what the purpose of, of the building blocks is and how they will fit together between um, different organizations. I think there's a lot that we can very, very usefully do in the very near term to align some of the things that need alignment. But the process of sort of, you know, working through how do the disclosures and sustainability reports form an input into a broader understanding of an organization's financial performance and its, and its outlook, such that it could eventually be reflected in the financial accounts. That is, that is um, very much the kind of long-term vision, I think, of, of this partnership. So Judy, um, I mean, all the academic research in the area would totally agree with all of that. I mean, we, we've been saying the same things as did um, Elko, but Elko, I want to come back to you because you said that impact reporting would never be mandatory. How then can financial, uh, re sustainably related financial disclosures or whatever they're called then be mandatory? if there's no impact reporting. And isn't that a concern if that were to happen? I did say in the United States. Okay, I missed that. Big, big caveat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, uh, US politics will never expand the, uh, the mandate of the SEC to, uh, to impact reporting. Um, so there you will see that pressure will come from investment communities uh, at large. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. And also that some very large businesses uh, will voluntarily take this on board. And you never know what the role of external auditors will be in this field. Uh, um, so that, 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 that's to that point. Uh, when you look at, at, for example, what's happening in Europe and AFRAC, and you take double materiality concept, including impact reporting there, it will be mandatory, of course. And some other, some other territories will also follow that concept. Uh, so as, as, as we speak about global and global baseline uh, and, and global financial, blah, 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 you always have the United States that goes more or less in a line gun. And then of course we have to deal also with China and India. So what, what does global mean? Uh, as globalish as we can, that's the best way forward, of course. Uh, but there will be some, some countries and regions where for, for whatever reasons, the impact reporting will not become mandatory. Um, but then again, don't underestimate the, 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 the pressure of, of benchmarking exercises and, and the role some of the rating agencies play here. Uh, the more we go and move towards a more standardized landscape. And I very much believe in the two pillars uh, on the one side. And why do I believe in there? Because the, fundam the fundamental basis of it is already there. We have a proof of concept. And as we all know, uh, and especially also in the EU, you need German and German industry behind you to pull things through. 
and in Germany, they only like things that, 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 that have a proof of concept that have been working. So if we now look at the landscape, on the one side, we have international accounting standards and, and glued into that will be uh, the ISSB uh, uh, with the financial effects on, 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 of sustainability on the enterprise value creation. Uh, and on the other side, you have GRI, uh, and the, the inside out and the outside in. And these two venerable bodies do exist for 25 years. And for 25 years, companies are reporting the financial and the impact side. So why would you try to fundamentally change that model that's already there? Of course, there needs things to be adjusted uh, uh, and, 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 and according to local legislation. And do not underestimate indeed the the political accountability that's important to drive it through but the fundamental pillars of this structure are already there and i would say let's build on to them one it will be faster cheaper businesses know more or less what to do uh, uh to me it's not a technical thing and what we will be currently are doing with the ISSB is also a mapping exercise whereby we look at so what's in ISSB, what's in GRI, where are they overlapping, where are they not and I hope by the end of the month we can come out with a publication and our mapping exercise with EFREC will be there in two uh, in around two weeks and with the ISSB we'll, we'll do some some joint press releases on how we build on onto this MOU and make it more concrete. But each and every time when I go back to, to this question and this question is being asked many times. So why should we try to fundamentally introduce something new where we have something that basically works if we make it mandatory or see my mentor or whatever, but just the basic fundamentals is not about the technical problems and issues because they are solvable. It's a governance issue that we're dealing with. So what will be the overlaying layer managing basically ISSB, IFRS or, or, or GRI in such a way that it is acceptable uh, to let's call it politicians and to have the accountability uh, part in place. What I think is worrying and although it, 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 it will be denied as ev by everyone of course, but of course we see something like a, 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 a discussion between what's happening at the EFREC side and what's happening at the ISSB side, and we are a bit squeezed in the middle. Uh, 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 denying that, that 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 would be wrong, but that must be remedied and it will be remedied, but that's a governance issue and not a technical issue. I rest my case. Um, so, so thank you very much for that. Yeah, can I come back to a point with just uh, on on the question four, which which Judy uh, addressed about the the building blocks, which is you know the, the way that the question uh, was asked was really about like the effectiveness of 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 splitting information into into different points, and uh, you know, I guess the idea being that it, like this is is this a problem? Uh, I actually think that, that to take it from a, a sort of different perspective than than what Judy did, um, or a different different tact on this that. I, I think it's actually necessary uh, at the end of the day to have information that different users are going to be using conveyed in different ways in some in some ways. Like we can't, if we put all of the information in the same place, then that's not going to lead to the most effective outcomes. And like, and, and we know this, right? We have all sorts of regulatory filings that are required, you know, whether it's to do with taxes or, or health and safety. Um, you know, there's all types of communication that companies engage in and trying to put it all in the same place wouldn't make it better, right? And so, so in some sense, we, we, if we wanna amplify the impact of, of information that's being disclosed, it has to be directed to the places and the users that are gonna be using it and in a way that they're going to actually be able to digest the information. And you know, if you think about issues around human capital, human capital management, for example, there are many things a company needs to manage with respect to its HR policies. Uh, there, are, there are many things that, that employees would want to know about the company that they're working at. Um, and so there are many things that the companies are going to want to communicate around that. But those conversations that companies would have with their employees even though investors would want them to 
manage those issues and have those conversations effectively, they don't need to hear all those same conversations. Like it's not most effective to primarily communicate that to investors and then hope that the employees also hear or vice versa. I think, you know, you're going to want to have a conversation with employees. You know, do you have uh, paid leave, for example, uh, parental leave? You know, there are, there are questions that employees would want to know. Um, but then from an investor perspective, they're going to be sort of a different perspective on that, where they're going to think about like how are you managing human capital, your employees, where are you seeing turnover? You know, uh, you know, do we have the right training in place? Uh, is this a retention issue? And and that would be a, a related, but a, but a different conversation, right? And so it you know, it starts with impacts. Uh, it is related, but if you you know it are viewing needs on TV aren't solved by having only one channel uh, where everything is communicated in the same place. That's probably more of a problem. So I, I think, you know, hopefully others would agree with this, but I think you know, some segmentation is, is probably uh, necessary. And I totally take Judy's points about the challenges around building blocks, that the building blocks are the disclosures. Uh, and, and like, that's a bit of a challenge and uh, uh, certainly acknowledge, acknowledge that as well. Thank you, Jeff. And Judy, I'd like to come back to the governance theme that um, Elko raised was, was, was the big issue in, in standard setting. Now, you've been the chair of the, the Global Sustainability Standards Board for a number of years now. And um, I wonder if you can just give us some insights and some examples of how that multi-stakeholder element to the GSSB actually informs the standard setting um, and, and, and whether you see that as, in, as, as important. It is essential to, um, uh, to GRI's sort of constitution um, and to, to the way that we uh, approach every aspect of, um, of, of the standard setting process. Uh, related to related to the GRI standards, um, the the, uh, the 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 constitution of GRI across all of its governance bodies comprises um, a variety of formally recognized um, stakeholder groups. So there are um, business enterprises, there are um, civil society organizations, um, uh, investors, labor. And what we call mediating institutions, which is which is essentially consultants and academics, um, uh, as as a as a as a as a final kind of um, stakeholder category, as well as an emphasis on global um, uh, representation um, and and other types of representation as well um, uh, for for the the individuals who take part in 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 various governance uh, uh, bodies for GRI, but also in the way that we approach the standard setting projects. So each project uh, is uh, set out by the uh, GSSB in order to accomplish um, you know a, a given a given aim. And in the development of a standard or the update of, of a standard, um, the GSSB will put together a technical committee or a project working group, generally speaking, um, to, to uh, drive the, that uh, standards creation process, which itself must be multi-stakeholder in, in its constitution. Um, when there are authoritative international um, documents that, that are available in, in reference to a particular topic, um, or when there are um, examples of good practice that may be of interest to the development of the, um, uh, of the, of the given standard, we have a, um, we have a sort of a, 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 a way of evaluating um, whether or not those those good practices themselves represent um, a, a sort of multi-stakeholder um, view of, uh, of of the of the given issue, so that we have some com comfort that the resultant standard doesn't skew unnecessarily in 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 one direction uh, or another. Um, and it and it fundamentally comes down to one of the principles in the GRI standards which is um, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, one of the historic principles in the GRI standards, which is that of stakeholder responsiveness, which is essentially the uh, recognition that 
organizations, it really is, um, I think, about the, 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 the concept of accountability that, uh, that, we heard, that we talked about earlier in the, um, in the conference today, that um, uh, institutions, organizations, enterprises have an obligation to respond to the needs of um, different stakeholders, not just privileging one or, or another. May, may I comment on that one? Because I think I have a nice example on how that works and that you see that, that regulators or lawmakers uh, are not always like the last resort for doing good. Um, you know, we, we, we have a GRI, a GRI 207, our tax standard that was initiated by US institutional investors. And with the community, we had uh, we had NGOs, international labor, uh, academics, accountants, intermediates, all in this one group. And we came with this standard, and it was well. So, some people were happy, some were not happy. But now, more than a hundred voluntarily report under this standard. So when we discussed this topic more than once in the last couple of years within the EU, et cetera, et cetera, uh, then it was deemed a topic too sensitive to include in the CDSR as a topic, too sensitive. Not too sensitive for business that was reporting, but apparently too sensitive for states that make a lot of money out of their beggar thy neighbor strategies. So that's why it was not included. Even though our friends here at the WEF uh, already in January 2020 in their first publication said that tax is a core ESG metric. So you see also that some, some counter forces out of business and out of investors brings stuff on the right track. And that's why we have, of course, this, this, this multi-stakeholder uh, due process on, on making the standards. Yeah, and that's a good example of why a lot of exam academics are concerned that without that, um, we won't get that accountability and we'll see more greenwashing from large companies. Uh, I've been monitoring the Q&A, and there are a couple of questions uh, uh, that might be uh, answered by our panelists. Uh, a question by Martin. Uh, would you consider the provider of capital's judgment on the risk profile of a company that has already made it into the cost of capital to potentially be required to be reported in financial reporting? Maybe Jeff, you can uh, um, comment on this. I'm sorry. Could you could you restate the question? I guess what Martin is asking is about uh, you know um, the views of capital providers have been incorporated in cost of capital uh, through uh, the risk uh, identification. Uh, so should uh, there be a role for sustainability reporting? I guess. I think. I mean. Unless I misunderstand the question, I think like there has there has to be. I mean, we know that there are real implications of firm activities, and to the extent that that it, investors get information about that, uh, uh, that allows them to then come up with valuation implications of that information of those activities. And uh, you know, Judy's point about investors are not a monolith is really important, right? There are gonna be day traders, uh, there are gonna be short-term traders, there are gonna be impact investors, they're gonna be uh, really long-term pensions, they're all different types of, actually every stakeholder group uh, is not a monolith. And that is one of the real challenges that, that people like Esther have to cope with, that, that their company does things and it's gonna be viewed widely differently depending, depending on different types of stakeholder groups and even within those stakeholder groups. But uh, I think what all of our organizations are, are focused on oftentimes is what are the activities? Let's disclose the activities that are critical. And can we, we, can we come up with good standards, good processes to put in place to map what's happening into disclosures? Uh, but those disclosures are often just intended to, to be uh, a window into what is happening, not necessarily the implications of that. And I think that's, and, and that's because different stakeholder groups are going to view things in different ways. Um, again, like not, not everything that, that uh, a company does is going to be viewed by all stakeholder groups 
uh, as equally important or even equally uh, sign like as, as good or bad. And so, uh, so, the, so we identify the issues and then, you know, once the information gets out there into the, into the public space, then, you know, for example, investors can, can take their views on it. And that allows for things like cost of capital implications to companies that are managing better or worse, the, the, you know, the externalities and the dependencies uh, that are, are, are most relevant to, to their business operations. I guess there's another re related question again uh, from Martin. It's about uh, the um, the way we consider topics to be material. So the draft FRAG guidance requires a topic to be called material if the impact is global. So this I'm reading out the question here. How useful is it to call climate change a ozone depleting substance to always be called material? irrespective of the magnitude of the emissions. So if a company's emissions is low, should that be still considered a material topic? I guess that's what Martin is asking. I think one of the, one of the challenges here uh, is that when, when we've thought about what investor needs are, at this point around investors are not a monolith, I think for, for decades, we've been able to assume that when somebody says investor, we kind of know what sorts of decisions they're making and also what sorts of information they're going to be looking at and what sorts of things are going to factor into the, the decisions that they do make. But, but I think there have been a number of changes, like the growth of impact investing and shifts from active management to passive management, uh, passive investment strategies that have led to, I think, you know, a, a a, a, a shift in the types of information that are going to be helpful and needed for capital markets to function well. And so, so part of it is like, if you are trying to sell products around uh, a particular strategy and that relates to greenhouse gas, uh, you know, carbon footprint, then you know, the market is going to need information in order to understand the carbon footprint of those investment vehicles, the, you know, the, the, the portfolios that are being put together and sold. And so that's a different perspective than materiality in terms of just you know active investing for a particular buy sell decision for a particular company. Um, and and I don't think, but my opinion, you know, this is just my my opinion, but I don't think we've really reconciled those changes in the way markets function and and the way that we have historically thought about what we mean by materiality and what we mean by investor needs. And so I think that's. Uh, something that is going to be addressed, I think, in the coming years, um, uh, you know, it, because, for example, like in the U.S. with the SEC's proposed rulemaking, uh, they're asking for scope one, scope two, um, you know, independent of, of a materiality assessment. Uh, and, and I think that that is going to lead to a lot of legal pushback. And so I think I hope an advanced conversation around what are what's like what are the roles of, of capital markets regulators and what are the needs all of the needs of capital markets and market regulators in facilitating capital formation need to think about what are the investment vehicles that are being you know used in their capital markets and what are the needs of, of investors who are 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 investing in them may, may i answer this question uh, martin's question of if i were a cfo of for example a a, a european business or or a, uh, an Indian uh, business. Um, so if I were a CFO and I would see that the price per ton carbon increased from November 2019 from 7 euro 50 per ton now to like 70 or 75 euro per ton expected to be at the end of 2023 uh, 195 euros per ton not taking this into account will be folly because it will destroy all my economic models. And if I were an Indian company, for, for example, engaged in plastics industry, uh, I would take into account the effects of the carbon border adjustment mechanism in Europe that will basically blow my uh, competitiveness out of the water if I would not take care. So you see here also that some typical topics, although it may be small, could have a huge financial impact due to market developments and regulatory developments. Yeah, 
if I may just add from the business perspective, you know, as a procurer, as a large company, um, uh, you know, we do screen out, you know, companies or suppliers who may not perform well in ESG. And because we have to, because their carbon footprint is my carbon footprint, and then we need to look at a global, you know, uh, uh, race to zero. And even Singapore has already patched it to zero. So it is, you know, really a business case that is it's like the cause of action, you know, versus cause of inaction. And now the biggest challenge in the emerging market is actually, especially in the ASEAN region, it has to get the SMD on board. They, are, they account for about 90% or more than 90% of the GDP and the businesses and employment. So how do we get the SMD on board? That is actually pertaining to the question about like, you know, the, you know, cost of capital and even cost of operations. So we have to larger player, I guess we have to really, you know, uh, drum into the supply chain that, hey, you are running a risk for being screened out, you know, from getting business from us, you know. So that is, you know, it's not just the capital alone. Of course, investors is very important, funding is very important from banks, but business to business is also an important aspect because, I have to account for their carbon footprint and their social impact as well. So I think it's just a it's very strong business case now. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, we are approaching the, um, the end of our formal plenary session and in fact, even consumed some uh, much of the Q&A time, but the discussion has been fascinating, uh, illuminating. Um, I, if I, uh, if I could just raise one uh, question at the end from myself, please, mm -hmm. just um, using the opportunity, um, uh, which might not necessarily align with what uh, has been uh, discussed, but taking the perspective of the users, and. Uh, I'm just I've just checked this morning the length of uh, the annual reports of some of the large European companies like uh, BP or uh, well uh, global companies uh, like uh, BHP Billiton, which is a mining company operating globally. The length of their annual reports uh, for last year have been uh, you know about 300 pages to roughly about 400 pages long. And uh, you know some academic research shows that the users don't necessarily really read that uh, volume of information, even though for corporates, it's really costly, um, although beneficial, of course, to produce. Now, with all these new initiatives and with, with when and if the new unified uh, standardization uh, comes to life, what are your views on the uh, on the impact on the preparers in terms of the uh, you know the, the volume of um, of work that they would need to uh, put in to prepare let's say not this time 300 or 400 page long documents but maybe 450 or 500 page long documents um, and whether in your views um, stake stakeholders such as capital market users would have the capacity the time to engage and ingest that information. Uh, uh, perhaps I would put this question maybe first to Esther because you, you are on the corporate side, so you've been engaged in the act preparation, but also more widely to any speaker who would like to comment on that, please. Yeah, actually for sustainability report since uh, 2017, it has been digital, we don't print it anymore. So uh, the number of pages, I mean, versus, you know, the cost of printing, of course, that is side issue. The most important thing is what we want to communicate has to be focused on mat addressing material issues. And uh, similarly, even any report, we are aligned in that sense, we actually issue together on the same date, although it is not in one report, uh, because our feedback from our readers, our, whether it's in that analysts or media, they preferred it separate. And in fact, I have a dedicated sustainability website. So those who are interested in ESG, they will just go to cdlsustainability.com. Those who are generic, like annual report, they will go to the corporate website. And I think this has been really very useful for us. And uh, yeah, I don't believe in printing. I don't even carry a name card for five years already. Everything it is digital, yeah. 
Can I, can I jump in here, uh, Mark? About the, I mean, I think our, our, our experience as, um, as standard setters, because one of the things that we do is survey the landscape of what's actually being reported by organizations in order to uh, work through the standardization uh, sort of process. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, the business community preparers of, of sustainability reports, what they, what they need probably more than almost anything is an end to overlapping, redundant, and especially conflicting disclosure requirements between different frameworks. The kind of multiplication of, um, uh, of, of, of sort of form filling that, that this engenders is very problematic for business. And, 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 and what you really do need is a sort of um, a clear, a uh, consistently applied framework that can be understood by companies in order to make good materiality judgments about just exactly what scope of, of content is necessary for, for their, for their uh, given uh, audiences. Um, and uh, will not um, just kind of proliferate the effort for, for, for no real benefit to the business. I mean, I would say about, you know, the, we can do nothing about annual financial reports in, in this conversation. I mean, it's sort of down to the wisdom of regulators what it is that they choose to require uh, issuers to, uh, to, to report. Um, issuers do tend to fill up the narrative with a lot of kind of, you know, excess um, that, that, that they could probably um, uh, eliminate. But I also think that this is a little bit of a red herring when we're talking about sustainability reporting. And for the purposes of GRI, we are quite agnostic about what document these disclosures go into. They could go into a, a financial report, they could go into a standalone sustainability report, they could go anywhere. Um, and, and, it, and it isn't about the kind of the pages and the cover that goes around the pages. It's about the provision of adequate disclosure to whatever audiences um, that, that may need it. Um, I, I think it's also, you know, a, a, a red herring to the extent that, um, you know, even financial markets look beyond the annual financial account and report for information about how they assess uh, corporate performance and prospects. So to, it's, I, I think we need to kind of not, not be too hung up about, um, about, about this issue of, of the length of reports or what goes in what or, or, or the other um, you know, kind, of, uh, kind of context, because it's, it's all really about enabling that decision making, um, not about kind of you know, segmenting this is, for, this is for one part of the world and this is for another part of the world. Yeah. Thank you, Judith. Um, I think, um, we are, I think we sorry. need to hand over yes. to Subash now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to... <laughs> Thanks, Carol and Mark. Yes, now we have come to the end of this very timely and thought provoking webinar about the future of uh, standard setting for sustainability reporting. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, our paper presenters, Begonia and Mario, the discussants, Shamila and David, and the panelists, Jeff, Judy, Elko, and Esther for enlightening us today. From these speakers, or from you, we have learned about the intended and unintended consequences of the IFRS's approach to sustainability standard setting. We also understood the role of the Global Reporting Initiative and regulators in various jurisdictions should perform to facilitate and promote organizations' contribution to the sustainable development goals. I'm grateful to the events team at the University of Glasgow for facilitating this event and my co-hosts, Mark, Yanis, and Carol. I would like to thank Carol also for her support and advice in, in organizing this webinar and for initiating a special issue on this important topic. Sustainability Accounting Management and Policy Journal, uh, in which I'm, a, I'm an associate editor as well, under the leadership of Carol, has always provided an outlet for critical and important conversations about difficult topics like what we have just discussed. So I conclude this event by encouraging you to read our forthcoming special issue in Samche on the topic of discussion today and contribute your evidence-based research relating to uh, the practice and policy issues on sustainability to Samche as well. So finally, thank you for your participation in the event. Thank you. <laughs>
Thank you. Bye-bye.